Hello there, and welcome to the Mindful Metal Jacket Podcast. Well, for those who hate the intro in this voice, that slight vocal fry version must have been really hard for you. Maybe you're fast forwarding already. I'll keep this one quick. We're back. It's the Mindful Metal Jacket Podcast with yours truly, Joe List. Right now, I am talking quietly and softly because I think it's fun and it drives some people crazy and other people like it. And also, I have a sleeping baby and a wife watching reality TV just outside that door. Anyways, I am gay. Uh, Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thanks for being here. All the same things I say every week. Please like, review, subscribe, comment, all that fun stuff. Sorry the uh, intros aren't that professional. By the time I'm done recording Joe and Ron on Talk Movies and Mindful Metal Jacket, my producer extraordinaire Lex says, don't forget we got to do the intros. And I say, I can't do that right now. I'll do it later. So I do it last minute on my telephone. But you get to see this little whale behind me and these beautiful photos of Nantucket. This is from Maine. This is from Nantucket. I love New England. If you're just listening, you have no idea what I'm pointing at. The point is, I love New England and so should you. It's the best part of the entire country, other than maybe Southern California. New England versus Southern California. Good thing to get the algorithm going. Sound off in the comments. What's better? Southern Cal or New England? Pacific Northwest also pretty extraordinary. Anyways, this week on the podcast, one of my favorite people again. And eventually, people have said this, I'll go out and get people who aren't just close friends of mine. I'll get some more therapists and doctors and science. Which, by the way, if you go back in the category, in the catalog, there's many of that. There's a lot of great um, non-comics on the feed. Go check them out. Um, a lot of great episodes and a lot of big comics in the previous episodes. Uh, Matteo Lane, Stavros Halkius, of course, and uh, Rosebud Baker. And we have um, Sharon Salzberg, which is a huge get. Judson Brewer, who wrote the book Unwinding Anxiety, which is incredible. But for now, more comedy friends. And uh, if you know me, if you know my work, if you listen to my podcast, you know I have so much uh, reverence and love for Henry Phillips, today's guest. Truly, and I said this about Chris Walsh last week, but also one of the five or ten funniest people I've ever met in my life. The best hang ever. Maybe the number one hang. Best guy to hang with. Brilliant um, comedian, musician, actor, writer. Um, I say it to everybody all the time. His film, Punching the Clown is by far the best movie about stand-up comedy ever. One of my all-time favorite films. And it was one of my all-time favorite films before I met and befriended Henry, which is a fascinating thing. And I might say this in the podcast. I can't remember. We recorded this a while ago. But it's a weird thing to have one of your favorite movies and Henry's basically playing himself. And then I became friends with my favorite movie character. That's a rare thing. It'd be like if you were best friends with Henry Hill, except way better. Anyways, he has that film, and then he made a sequel called um, Punching Henry, and uh, I am in that film, as is my lovely wife, Sarah Talamash, as well as Sarah Silverman, Doug Stanhope, um, Jim Jeffries. Check out both films. They're both hilarious and amazing. This is going longer than it should. Um, We had a great time. I always love talking to Henry. I can't remember what we talked about, but he's just uh, fun to listen to. We talk about anxiety. There's some great stories. Uh, Make sure you follow Henry everywhere and shoot him a note. Tweet at him, Instagram, send him a message saying, hey, love the episode. Keep sending them to me. I always appreciate it. And uh, share, tell friends, spread the word. Let's keep this thing going. It's not easy to to do these, but I enjoy doing them and I like doing because you seem to enjoy it. I would love if it um, kept getting bigger and better. So spread the word, please. And there will be something like a Patreon for this soon. It's going to be on Punch Up Live, punchuplive.com. Go check out this website. It rules. All you got to do is put your email in and you get access to my special. And uh, soon we're going to have um, a little subscription-based bonus for all this stuff. It'll be like a little Joe List, My Metal Jacket Patreon. Uh, Not quite set up yet. It's a new website, but for now you can go over there. You can get tickets to my shows, DC Improv, November 17th and 18th. Pittsburgh Improv, March 28th and 30th. I know it's a ways out, but get them early. And Tacoma Comedy Club, January 11th to the 13th, Poughkeepsie. Um, Punch up live and sign up for my email list and enjoy this conversation with one of my all-time favorite people, 
favorite comics and just a brilliant uh, artist. Also a great uh, film composer doing the score for the documentary I'm making about Tom Dustin, which should be out, will be out this year at some point. So just an extraordinarily talented man and great friend. All right. Enjoy this conversation with my friend Henry Phillips. We're back. <laughs> Are we back? <laughs> it's always so weird. Starting, it's like Louis has that great uh, bit he did one of his specials. He's like, it's so hard to start a special because you're just like, all right, uh, I'm talking now. Yeah, no, that's that's what kept me from from being good at it because I couldn't <laughs> get past that moment. <laughs> Something just happened. It's Somebody, awkward. Oh, the AC well, came up. Because uh, I remember asking a lot of my friends, you know, because I was always the musical comedy and then I wanted to start doing the stand up and I'd ask a lot of my comic friends. Like, what's the very first thing you say when you go up? Oh, I start going to my bit. No, but the very first, like, <laughs> do you say hi? And they're like, ah, yeah, I guess I'd probably say, hey, how's it going or whatever. But I've have you ever heard that it's bad to say, how are you guys doing tonight or whatever? And I don't think anyone's ever said that to me. I've heard, I've heard people say, don't ask them how they're doing or whatever. I don't know. But I'm like, if I just went up to a table of people... I'd probably start with something like, you know, hey, how's it going? I wouldn't yeah. just start talking. Well, like Stephen Wright has the thing. He just says thanks. That's like he. Yeah. Like, oh, and it's perfect. Oh, and he it's says amazing. Thanks, and then yeah. he starts. And like Johnny Cash would be like, hello, I'm Johnny Cash. And then but a song is easier because I feel like you can't just go into a song. No, you can't just come out and start playing a song. Yeah. Well, you have to say, hey, thank you. I don't know. <laughs> it's one of those things where you. When you think about it, you wonder, what the hell do I do? I feel that I way with know. podcasts, too. <laughs> I have a joke right now that I've been doing where I say, when you brush your hair, what is your what is your non-brushing hand doing? Oh, do you wow. have any idea? Can you think of it? Because I in the joke, I say, I was brushing my hair the other day, and this is true. And I looked over, my other hand was just like up here. <laughs> it was like this. And I was like, why is my hand doing that? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, there was like an interview with uh, Scorsese that I saw once years ago where he was on camera one of those rare moments where he was like, I think he was in acting in somebody else's film or whatever. And they were just like, yeah, I just walked from that side to the other side. And while he's walking the whole time, he was just going like, how does, how do you walk? How does one walk? Like I'm trying to walk, but you're just, you're thinking about it too much. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. It is a fascinating thing about acting and you've obviously done some acting. I've done a little acting. It is weird. We're like some. I think. I think you're very good. And you're, I mean, both of us have been in movies, feature films, where we're basically playing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that helps. Although some people say it's more difficult, and I always argue with this. Like Louis, like that's harder. And I'm like, then <laughs> how? Then playing like a 1380 court jester, <laughs> <laughs> doth no how. Like I'm like, it's way easier. I just talk like this. Yeah. But anyways, it's weird how some people are so unnatural as actors. They literally can't say, hey, uh, how you doing? Can I get a hot dog? Yeah. They're like, hi, one. <laughs> like, I, it's very strange. Yeah, we yeah we had that when we made our, our film. And, uh, punching it the Clown. Was, yeah, Punching the Clown. And um, I'm, I'm going to try to say this without specifically insulting anybody, but there were several people that came in to audition for this one part where they literally had no lines, but they just had to stand there. But they were, what I guess you'd call it a featured extra because they were supposed to be large and a security guard that people are talking about. Yeah. And we had a couple of people come in and one of them specifically, I remember going, wow, this guy is a bad actor at, at literally just standing. <laughs> like he's not even doing anything and he's a bad act. Somehow he's managed to be a bad actor by doing and not even doing anything. It's almost impressive. Like you could just see him kind of, <sighs> and you're like, yeah, that's bad. That's not the way someone just stands and does nothing. Yeah. It's almost impressive. I always do this when I watch movies, especially movies I've seen a hundred times. I just rewatch movies. You just look for bad extras and there's some really bad <laughs> moments. A lot just, of movies have bad moments. Yeah. <laughs> you can find guys that you're like, what is he doing? Um, but anyways, you have such a great voice. I, I mean, it's funny because you're a singer also, but you have such a great vo uh, radio voice. Thanks, and I'm man. genuinely like, was there a, a moment where you were like, hey, I have a great voice? There was. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> setting you up to sound like an I asshole. I want to make sure that this isn't like I told Joe, hey, talk about my good voice and then I can <laughs> go into this bit. Like, I, I literally did not do that. That would be really bad. But, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. Well, for one thing, my friends always would kind of make fun of my voice. And I think that's usually a sign that it's at least unique, whether it's good or not. Right. But uh, 
I remember being in, uh, in Indiana. I was in, I think it was South Bend, Indiana, and I was doing the radio in the morning and, um, you know, you, you go there to promote the club or whatever. And the higher up, I guess it'd be like the program manager or somebody came in and said, this guy's voice, Hey, can you come in and say, Hey, you're listening to, you know, WB, uh, uh, LJ or whatever. Uh, can you just say that? And I was just like, Oh yeah, I've, I've done that. They call it like IDs or whatever. Yeah. I did it for Bob and Tom or whatever, where I'd be like, Hey, this is Henry Phillips and you're listening to uh, WBLG or whatever. And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, do it again. But don't say the Henry Phillips thing. Just say <laughs> you're listening to WBLG. And I'm like, wait, so you want me to just do a voiceover gig for you for now? Like, yeah, no. you're not a celebrity. Yeah. You're just working. If I don't say my name that then there's literally nothing in it for me whatsoever. Yeah. I'm just giving you that. And I, and I said, I wouldn't, I was oh, like, yeah, you. I said, nah, it's just, I don't know. You people get paid for that and I don't want to do it. And ironically, I've never been paid to do it, but I'm still glad I didn't do it. Cause I felt like I would have been taken advantage of. Yeah. I think that's I good. You, you, yeah. got, you got ethics, but yeah, your voice is a uh, tremendous, great singing voice as well. Thanks, I feel man. like I've heard you make fun of your singing voice, but uh, is that, uh, yeah, it's a uh, nice, nah, Usually when I'm in uh, on the road doing comedy, you know, uh, the second show on Saturday night or whatever, it's, it gets pretty raspy because of, in addition to the fact that I'm using it all day long and, you know, for two shows, but also bad habits, you know, like drinking and uh, formerly smoking and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so I always feel like when I listen to it back, it sounds a little too raspy. No, it it's sounds- not the voice of an angel. It sounds great. It's but, wonderful. Uh, well, thanks, and man. it's soothing. I, I feel like everyone's already going to soothe. Let's 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 get it. Let's get in there. Let's really get down. <laughs> and let's get down and dirty. I I I think that if I were to count, I think I would say that I've done about three hundred auditions for voiceovers, and I've never booked one in my really? life. Really? Yeah, I've had people approach me and say, "Hey, can you do a voiceover thing?" And I'll pay you. And I've said, "Sure," but I've never. Um, I've never booked it like it through the traditional channels. But are we talking like Disney? Like, wow, get out of here. No, it, it, <laughs> there's, there's like... some of them that you, it, it's like, uh, we just need, uh, it's an insurance commercial. And the whole bit is that there's like 20 cavemen. And so we just want you to be one of the cavemen and you just need to go. Uh, 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 uh. And I didn't get that. You know, it's like, oh, that's when I was like, this is some kind of scam. They're just using their friends, but they're making everybody send something in. I did one voiceover audition. And it was for a, um, a, what do you call it? Seth MacFarlane new show. I don't think it's come out yet. Now it won't because everyone's on strike. But it was like a Boston accent. And I can talk in a Boston accent because I'm from there. Yeah. And uh, But I couldn't keep it consistent in the audition, even though I'm <laughs> from there. It was like so embarrassing because I'd be like, what the fuck, dude, dude, dude. And I, I, I did like 75 <laughs> takes and I would just lose it and go British or pirate. And <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. Like, I, Why can't I do my home accent? It's really, it's difficult. And those guys that really are... Um, Talented, obviously. It's yeah. like I'm like one of these guys that sounds like such a jackass who's like, I'll tell you that Mel Blanc, I think he had talent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was something. Hey folks, this episode is brought to you by Better Help. You know how much I love Better Help. If you're a regular listener to this podcast, you know how much I appreciate Better Help. You know how much I believe in Better Help. I believe in therapy. I think it's so important for every individual to get some therapy. When I hear someone say they don't go to therapy, I think, well, you are at a disadvantage. It's never been easier to get therapy. You can use BetterHelp. BetterHelp's online therapy is the best. You can talk to a licensed therapist any way you want, through video, through chat, phone. You can even message them. How simple is that? I know I love to do that. Getting the help you need has never been easier. One of my closest friends, I got him hooked up with better help with 10% off. He's loving it. He's addicted. He said, I can't believe I didn't do this before. Thank God this has come. It's revolutionized the way you get therapy. How nice is that? Video chat. You can do it from home. You can do it wherever you want. All you got to do, take a quick quiz to get matched with a licensed therapist. If you ever need to switch therapists, no problem. You can change any time for no additional charge, no questions asked. Just say, hey, I need a new one. Maybe not every therapist is for everybody. They're going to help you find the best one fit for you. I have a therapist that I love, and I'm better because of it. Right now, folks, you can make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash metal, M-E-T-A-L, today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com 
slash metal. Betterhelp.com slash metal. Do it today. Start feeling better as soon as you can with better help. Thanks, guys. Back to the show. Well, it's like, uh, yeah, I was born in New York City, lived there till for till I was about 10. Then we moved to Englewood, New Jersey for three years. And I listened to tapes of me, like cassette tapes of me talking when I was a little kid. And it's really thick New York accent. Right. But now if I tell people, yeah, I'm originally from New York, they're like, do a New York accent. And I'm like, hello, why are you there? <laughs> I'm like, I can't do it. It doesn't even sound anything close to it. Right. It's weird. It's <laughs> got to be natural. I'm like that with an Irish accent. I, I can get into it, but I have to start by singing. I have to be like, <laughs> I remember Dublin City <laughs> and the real old times. Well, you have a very specific voice. And more importantly, you have a comedic cadence and I think uh, that's going to be good for you. I think I can see you being one of the characters in one of these Pixar movies. Oh, <laughs> definitely. Serious. Do you want to hear an AI version of my voice right oh, now? Oh, God, I'm freaked out by AI. This is all I talk about. Uh, Are you worried about AI destroying humanity? A, li a little bit. And we can talk about that. Um, not, not too much. But I hope somebody made a uh, an AI version of me talking. But it's it. I think it really points out what the difference is. Because here's the AI version. So this is this is not me talking. Oh. <laughs> what happened? My phone just died. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's it's probably fine. Well, we're not gonna <laughs> Well, that was gonna be exciting. How did um, your phone die? You don't you don't have your uh... No, it's down to zero. We uh <laughs> Anyway, we'll just cut that part. Well, we did. We did just hike across Burbank, which is and now so we're going to bring in a naked lady. Ah, oh, she's not here all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, we did just walk about four <laughs> miles in jeans in Burbank, and it's ninety-eight degrees outside. Yeah. Now nah, maybe time. the phone got hot and just said, or maybe it's AI going, "Hey, you're not going to exploit me." I don't know. Um, but that sucks because I thought that would be fun. Maybe what we could cut it in. Yeah. Okay. They could probably do that. We can do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. It's hard to react. I can't react to Okay. It. So- Did you have something lined we'll, up? We'll assume that say? it played, and, and I'll just say that the difference is that the AI version of me sounds really smart and deliberate and talks like it knows the way every sentence is going to end, whereas I don't always do that. And so that's why I feel like it's hard for it to replace us because so much of what we're doing- is I guess flawed. I don't want to sound cliche, you know, it's like, uh, but yeah, it's the uncertainty that it can't figure out yet. Right. We're too dumb to be replaced. Yeah. AI. Yeah. <laughs> it's too, it, they'd have to really dumb down the technology. No, it, it terrifies me. But are you a person that works? Cause I feel like you have uh, maybe some hypochondria and whatnot, but do you yeah. worry about the, the future? Like, are you like climate change and AI is going to kill all of us? Is it like existential? Yeah. Or is it just you getting cancer? Cause I've always been worried about the whole planet ending as yeah. well as cancer and heart attack and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do worry about it a lot. I, uh, what I worry about is the lack of worrying about it. Yeah. Like I feel like if I, if, cause I look at friends of mine that are really successful and I'm like, this person never thinks about any of this stuff. And as a result, they're just killing it. Um, but I feel like if I do that, I'm putting my head in the sand or something like that. But, uh, yeah, there are a lot of major issues. Uh, the, the union stuff, uh, I grew up in a family where both of my parents were, union members and we were able to live in a in a middle class uh environment as with health care and uh you know stuff like that and i i believe in all that stuff i don't like that the rhetoric has sort of changed to immediately people are just like nah the the people who make seventy five thousand dollars a day really should they they got there because of hard work and they deserve to keep all of the money and nobody right, right. else gets anything uh, I don't know why I'm I'm hearing more people say that than it's like, no, we got to have a society where everybody does well. Otherwise we're all screwed. Like we want people to be able to afford to go to your comedy show and stuff like that. How are they going to do that if they I get keep paid peanuts? I keep know? having this when I bring up uh, AI replacing all the jobs and everything. And people yeah. are like, you're good. Live entertainment is going to be good because that's something they can't replace. And you're in a creative field. So like you have like the one job that can't be replaced. And I'm like, Okay, that's great. But if 100% of my fans have no jobs, yeah. it's going to be difficult. That's exactly it's like it. Patreon and YouTube and live show. Who's coming to the live show if robots have 100% of the jobs? There's a ripple effect. Yeah. Yeah. I would like other people to also do well, which is like a weird thing when people are like, you're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. No. Well, I would like everyone else to survive. It's well, that's what fun. happened. Yeah. In 2008, remember we had that really big crash yeah. and um, 
I remember going, well, that's not going to affect me. A, I don't own a home. I'm renting. And also I just go to comedy clubs and people show up and uh, that's the end of that. Well, and then I realized, oh, wait a second. Yeah, they're not going to be going to comedy clubs if they just lost their home. Or yeah. if, uh, you know, like we, we tried to sell our movie in 2009. Fun. Uh, at, we went to Slam Dance and uh, they showed the film and everybody just was laughing like gangbusters. It was great. And then afterward, all the people at the festival were really depressed. They're like, man, if you were here one year ago, you would have sold this thing for a freaking million dollars. <laughs> And we're like, okay, great. <laughs> but yeah, apparently 2009, that was, 2008 was like the last year that people were giving independent films like a million dollars for licensing and stuff. And then everything changed because the economy got screwed. So yeah, we want to keep, you know, everybody doing well. And uh, yeah. So did you have like, when you were like a, a kid, like a boy, did you ever hear about a story or whatever or war or anything? You're like, where, how am I going to live? This is, I'm going to die. Like from the time I was like seven, I remember being like, the world is going to end. I'm not going to be able to live and be an adult. Yeah. There were a couple of, uh, well, I remember, um, it's before my time, but the Cuban missile crisis was apparently traumatizing for a hell of a lot of people but yeah i just would have killed remember, myself even if i was nine i would have been like yeah. i would have smashed my head in the little desk until it was bludgeoned i remember being like 16 and that's embarrassing i was in high school dealing with high school problems but there was a big and, and anybody with like a with a computer right now can look it up but there there was a little bit of a, a nuclear escalation and i remember being terrified about it uh during the Reagan era. And then that went away. There's that great podcast, hardcore history or whatever. Do you know that? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's great. A lot of people know it but, uh, and I might've even butchered the name of it, but uh, I remember he starts one of them by saying like, if somebody had a gun to you and uh, they put it to your head and you know, for a while you'd be like terrified, but if they had it on you for like 10 years, eventually you're going to start just going back to business right. you know yeah yeah um well, that's kind of what the the nuclear situation has been it's like in the beginning everybody's like wait what you have a bomb that can literally just blow up the entire world and everybody was freaking out yeah but then i think by the time the 90s came around it's like well let's party you know yeah. Who cares? now everybody has apparently it. nobody's doing anything with it so let's party well that but it's me, still there it gives me some hope for ai like we thought yeah there'd be like a nuclear holocaust and there wasn't yeah so and then i heard another great metaphor about ai and nuclear weapons like fire is like the most damaging thing fire will kill you and burn you and burn down your house and destroy the woods but yet we all have fire in our counter yeah like we've just learned how to use it yeah and not burn everything down so maybe that's a great example maybe uh, no and the the naysayers uh a lot of times you could say hey well you know uh whatever you were saying was going to happen didn't happen. So you were wrong. But then also we might've actually made policy adjustments that kept those things from happening too. Right. You know? So those people who were afraid of the fire were probably like, yeah, you know, you're right. We should probably figure out a way to harness it and control it. You know? Um, and also fire is not smarter than us. Right. Yeah. AI is. Yeah. But, no, the, but, but also, uh, yeah, when I was, uh, growing up, I had, uh, terrible hypochondria and i think that it's a a mechanism where if you can imagine the very worst 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 case scenario happening then you're prepared for it somehow. right and so it's like well now anything less than that is going to make me feel good yeah well it definitely it feels like it's mentally a a protective thing we feel like we're better off worrying about stuff because we let our yeah. guard down then we'll get the thing because we weren't worrying yeah. about it um, being happy, like, is the most unprepared, ridiculously absurd idea that you can have, you know, it's like, what you'd be happy. Then, then all of a sudden some shit's going to go down and you're not going to be ready for it. Yeah, exactly. I tried to do a joke like that where people are like, um, I just never in a million years thought this would happen to me. And I'm like, Oh, I could never say that because I have thought everything was going to happen to me. <laughs> Every scenario. I was like, yeah. no one, not, there'll never be a moment where I was like, I wasn't even expecting this. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I've gone through every death scenario. Yeah. When you see on the news, they're like, we've heard of this kind of thing happening, but um, just, we didn't think it was going to happen on our own block. Well, 
Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I for sure thought about it. Every morning I go through like a checklist. I so, literally pictured the guy doing so wh- it. So what does your anxiety look like today and then? Uh, do you wake up with anxiety? Do you go to bed with anxiety? Uh, it you, comes and goes. Because uh, you feel very calm and cool. You feel very uh, L.A. You look there's very cool. A, there's a lot of... Um, I, well, I'm a big believer in this fight or flight. I, I don't think it's a theory. I think it's an actual phenomenon, right? Yeah, like, yeah. like that we, we have They've added freeze uh, chemicals to. inside of us that, that give us the energy to either run away or to fight. And in my case, it's mostly run away. But if you're not doing anything with it, like you're not jogging or you're not doing something, you're just kind of letting it sit there and it's, it's hard to fall asleep and yes. you need to have sleep. So if you don't have sleep, you get weak physically, you start having weird things happen with your arm or something or your eyes twitching and then you're like oh now that i'm getting some weird disease and so yeah you can have a self-fulfilling prophecy i found that if you can really uh try to get a handle on uh sleep and also uh do some something physical throughout the day to try to work off some of that energy that helps but i'm telling you in my late 20s i've spent more time going through breakups than i have in (laughs) in happy relationships. And I've been in a happy one now for about seven years. So that tells you (laughs) I've spent like, what's the old thing about like, you know, if, if you go through a breakup, I think that the, the breakup depression is supposed to be half of whatever the relationship relationship, for me, it was always way disproportionate. Yeah. It'd be like, it'd be like a year of being depressed over like a one night stand or something, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And that happened to me like several years in a row. And, uh, but yeah, so I, I'd wander around and just, uh, you know, wonder if I'm ever going to, you know, it's just ridiculous, ridiculous stuff. So it's a lot of like relationship anxiety. Oh yeah. No, yeah. I had, I had a lot of that. And ironically, you're chasing people away when you have that. This of is course. all stuff when you're younger, you just, you screw up. But then when you're older, you start not really being as passionate about stuff like that. You don't really care as much. And then and you become a more attractive person, I think, because they're like, oh, this person seems mellow. But uh, I think that all the time with like relationship, like I'm like now, if I was single now, I feel like I could kill it. Because first of all, you're just way less horny. Yeah. Like, so like when you're 22, you're like desperately need to have sex. So you're like, come on, please. Hello. You're like, I'm, yeah, I'm pulling yeah. my thumb off and being like juggling, mm-hmm. trying to get laid. But now it's like, I can take it or leave it. So that's yeah. a huge power. Plus you just have like wisdom. You're not shaking. You're just like, oh, all right, that will hang out. Nice. Yeah. I can actually like listen to people now. Like I was 23. If someone was talking, I was like, this. Oh, I know. You know? Yeah. Well, now you're like, oh, that's interesting. Oh man. Yeah, listening is hard also for comics. Like, I don't know what you just said, but uh, no. <laughs> no, I do remember one time uh, there was a girl that I was dating that was that was so boring. Uh, and I've dated a lot of girls, so that that's, I'm safe in terms of she doesn't know which one. Like, if you're thinking I'm talking about you, it's not you. There's but, probably like 60 women right now. But like, um, I remember in order for me to seem entertained during our conversations, I would have to actually think of other funny stories that I had heard in order to be genuinely laughing. Like when she'd tell a story, I'd be like, <laughs> but I'm literally thinking about something to another buddy of mine said like two weeks ago. But, uh, that's really dangerous. If she's like, yeah, you know, my, yeah, she's like, like, like a lump on my, my ass cheek. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's like, I got to make sure it's a comedy story for sure. But yeah, if she suspects, are you thinking about somebody else's story right now? <laughs> Uh, no, I was thinking about you. Why do you say that? Because like, you have an erection and you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, you definitely have to make sure that, uh, that whatever response you have is appropriate. Right. But some of these, these feelings too could be repressed anger. Did you ever read Healing Back Pain? One of my favorite books ever. I have. Yeah. I, I have mixed feelings about it. Oh boy. Um, it, it's, it's basically saying that it's psychological right well something i mean there is like so some people get like mad at that book they're like no no my, my back hurts and i'm like well it does hurt but the cause could be psychosomatic but he does address also like you may you should exhaust the other yeah thank you i'm, I'm glad you said that because uh, i had i had something called a herniated disc which is like uh it's in your spine and then you have this this disc in between the spine bones i trying to do the best I can here, but it it gets, uh, swollen up sort of like a sprained ankle or something like that. And it, it compresses 
the nerves, all of your nerves like come out of your neck and go down to your fingers and stuff. Yeah, and course. it causes pain, tingling, numbness and everything. And you can get an MRI. And I did, I got an MRI and the doctor said, yeah, you see how all these on the left side are all normal. And then right in the middle of there, you got this one that's all blown up. And I'm like, holy crap. Yeah, that is. So I was like, well, I guess that's what it is. And then my friend gives me the book and he's like, yeah, no, they're, they're all full of it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, they, he showed me, <laughs> did you think he made up a fake drawing or something where he's like, let's make it look like that one's big. And he goes, no, nah, they're full of it. But you're absolutely right. In the first couple of pages of it, he says, um, look, you know, if you have an actual medical problem, you know, exhaust those options, like you said. And then I brought that up to my friend. I said, well, he even said, if you have an actual medical problem and my friend's like, he didn't say that. No, he didn't say that. Like he's all in favor of like, uh, every doctor is just full of crap. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so that's why I had mixed feelings about it, but no, I specifically remember this author saying that in the beginning. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's like, if you're in like a car wreck and your fucking head <laughs> yeah. is bleeding, they're not like, just meditate. It's all in your head. Um, which yeah. did I ever tell you that story about when I spilled the, um, Tea. I had a Starbucks tea exactly like this one. It was boiling hot. This is in Minnesota. I got in a cab. I was opening for Gary Gullman and I was holding it in between my feet. It was like a caravan cab. Yeah. And uh, whatever that hit a turn or something happened, it just spilled all in my my foot. And so when I first started to get into meditation and stuff and Thich Nhat Han, and I was like, oh, that hurts, but I know exactly what to do. I just got to meditate through it. And this pain is just, um, it's just an appearance in consciousness which is true. So I sat there and like really tried to do this. And like my ankle just started like fucking like throbbing. And finally I was like, ah, and I like ripped my sock off and the water had soaked through and I had a third degree burn, like the size oh, of a silver geez. dollar. And then it turns out you're not supposed to just meditate. Like if you're something's burning you, you have to get the burning <laughs> yeah, substance yeah. off your skin. Yeah. Like I thought like, yeah, oh, there's I'll a just. Physical, yeah. Yeah. Like something is currently burning. And I let like 175 degree water yeah. really soak <laughs> into my foot because I was like, I'm a Buddhist now. Yeah. Yeah. But you're like, that's not how you're supposed to do it medically. Yeah. But I I know why you did that because I, yeah, I've heard those stories before. It's like you, you'll you hear like kind of urban myths or like that kind of uh, your, your roommate uh, will say something like, you know, you know that there's like Buddhist monks that will just like put fire on their hand like for a half hour. And it's like, really? That sounds like it would, it would burn their hand at some point. <laughs> no, because their mind is above. Or uh, apparently jalapeno peppers or like hot peppers in general have something in them. I remember reading an article and it might have been clickbait or whatever. It was like uh, it was talking about how the the heat, the quote heat that you feel when you have a jalapeno pepper is not – it's not like regular uh, heat from fire where that's like actually doing damage to your hand. It's stimulating the same uh, nerves that are sending a message to your brain that you're hurting, but it's actually not doing any harm. That's what it said. It's like, hmm. uh, it's, it, it's just giving you the impression. It's, it's, it's called capsaicin, I guess. And it's, it's defense mechanism from people eating it, I guess is, uh, this thing where it makes you think that you've eaten something that's too hot to eat. Interesting. But you're not actually doing any damage. But that, I don't know, that's kind of hard to believe. I thought there was like a metaphor coming. Uh, no, but it does remind me of, of <laughs> one of your bits that I love actually, where it's like, uh, what's the difference between having an anxiety attack and thinking that right, you're going right, to die right. and then actually dying? So it's like, yeah, not a lot of difference between thinking that your hand is burning and oh it's okay it just feels like your hand is burning i always thought that people would be like it's all in your head and i'm like well everything that's ever existed is in my <laughs> yeah. head that's where a hundred percent of things that green chair is in my head also. yeah yeah that's uh, life is existing in my head yeah so so that's where you want that's where the the problem is i would like yeah. it to not be there i don't <laughs> yeah, want it in yeah. my head yeah um, no that's a great point i, I just um point. heard a story speaking of like psychosomatic and stuff is uh, there's a story maybe you've heard it before about a guy and it's a real story a guy a construction guy like fell off a roof and he just landed on a nail like a f five inch nail or four inch i don't know how long nails are but a long nail and it went through his boot and up like came out from the bottom of the boot up through this toe of his boot and he was writhing in pain and crying and screaming. Ah. And they, um, you know, the ambulance had to come and they put him in the ambulance and brought him to the ER. 
and uh, they gave him fucking fentanyl or whatever or pain medicine because he was just writhing and crying and then slowly after like an hour or whatever or however long it took to get there they took his boot off slowly and it turned out the nail had gone in between his toes perfectly there wasn't blood didn't even touch him wow and this is like, this isn't like, this is like a construction guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, an accountant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> It's yeah, like exactly. a man. And, yeah. Uh, it never even touched him, but the the mental thing was so there that um, he wow. just felt the pain. And the pain was real. He's really feeling that yeah. pain. It's like a mistaken message. Like, uh, yeah, exactly. The body was just like, oh, we've been hit. Oh, let's tell the brain that we got hit. Yeah. Well, that's the fascinating thing about the, the brain and everything. The mind, body, like, because like talk about like sex like if i just sit here and picture like you know a, a woman's panties being taken off slowly like i can feel it in my dick i'm like Hold on, let me try it now um <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, like yeah, you can yeah. register that and it's the same with anxiety like yeah. the fact that you can sit i mean we're older guys like i assume you're like me if if you had to you could sit and masturbate to completion without <laughs> a person or porn you could just sit there and be like i'm thinking of this thing and yeah. young kids probably can't, but it's the same with like anxiety. If you're able to do that with sex, your brain, mind and body can react to whatever um, nerves I, are thinking about death. Yeah. I remember some th during some of my real, I mean, I had some pretty dark moments and I remember talking to my dad uh, when I was in my twenties and he said that he had really, really bad moments, like, like dark anxiety moments, yeah. panic attacks that feeling like there's a black cloud above you and there's nothing right. that you can do to get out from under it. Um, he had uh, a lot of depression. Uh, well, he was, I think he was actually in the real depression too. And he was depressed. <laughs> so it's like doubly depressed, but, um, but yeah, so I think there might be a genetic element and I remember reading books about it and stuff. So I had to develop little uh, techniques um Drinking helped a lot. And then, uh, <laughs> no, but uh, no, I had to develop things like um, try as hard as I can to think of the funniest thing ever, because you can't, you can't be depressed while you're laughing. Right, at right, right. Or I would call friends and talk to them on the phone and just bore the shit out of them. You know, right. um, I would listen to music like crazy. I mean, uh, I don't know, but they say a lot of great stuff happens. I mean, uh, Tchaikovsky, I'm a fan of classical music and Tchaikovsky was in the closet gay and uh, it was extremely taboo in Russian culture for someone to be gay. And sure. uh, he made incredible music. He probably just was like, well, all right, well I'm just going to put everything I've got into this. Right, right. And uh, so, yeah. Um, so it's good to be depressed. Yeah, I think, well, no, it, it creates good art. You, as an individual, you're fucked. You're going to cut your ear off or something yeah, like yeah. that. But everybody else gets to enjoy the things that you make. So, so that's good. I want to get into a little bit of your uh, origin story. Because both your parents are actors. Yeah. And, and, and pretty successful actors, right? Uh, successful in that neither of them ever had to, to get a, you know... Uh, a job, a, you know, a waiter, waiter job or right, anything right. like that. Um, they, between the two of them, they were always able to, to make it through. And because of the fact that the union was structured so that people that just worked now and then could actually raise kids and have a, a regular life. Right, you know? right. So when do you remember, do you have brothers and sisters? I have one brother, yeah. He's older or younger? He's two years older. Did he go into showbiz too? No. As a matter of fact, neither my brother nor I were ever pushed into the business. Every every time we brought up that we wanted, hey, like, you know, when I'm 13, put me in commercials, man. And my mom would be like, no, nah, you don't want to have anything to do with that crap. It was terrible. I actually did when I was, I when we were in New York as a little kid, I think I was like five. And my mom, she did a lot of commercials back then in New yeah. York uh, through the 70s and 80s. She cleaned up in the commercial thing. And one time there, it was, I think it was St. Joseph's cough drops. And they said, by the way, do you have a kid? And, uh, my mom's like, yeah, okay, well we need a kid. We were going to do the casting thing, but if it's your kid, why don't you just, if you're playing the mom, just bring your kid in there. My mom's like, does he need to act or anything? Well, he literally, all he has to do is say, oh mom, I'm sick. And, uh, and my mom's like, all right. So she brought me in there and I remember, being on the set. And I don't know how much of this is me remembering or me hearing my mom tell the story, which is not a flattering story about me, but there's all these cameras and everything lights kind of like we are right now. And, uh, 
um, I was in bed and my mom is there and it's a cough drop commercial. And, uh, the director's like, okay, uh, action. So you're going to say, Oh mom, I'm sick. And I was just like, and they're like, come on, just, Oh mom, I'm sick. That's literally all you have to say. And I was like, Oh, I'm sick. <laughs> and then, uh, if you could have told me how much money I was throwing down the toilet back then, like, like they made a lot of money for those commercials because they yeah, bought yeah. them for like, you know, it would be like $60,000 or something. And, yeah. and I, instead I just, I never said it. Really? And, yeah. And my mom was like, yeah, no, I, I was not in the commercial. I think my mom did the commercial and they got some other kid. Oh, to do this it. is devastating. Oh yeah. And, um, it was St. Joseph's cough drops. And then, uh, she never tried to push acting on me ever again. Wow. She must've been like, my and, son uh, sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking no, it was awful. Act. Yeah. It was terrible. Damn. I just like, it was just a painful idea to, to repeat this line that this guy was telling me to do. But, uh, so yeah, I, I got really into music and I was terribly uh, shy about that too. I remember, uh, one time I was rocking out in front of my uh, mirror and a friend of mine uh, came to visit and he opened the door while I was in front of my mirror, like oh, pretend, pretending to be like Led Zeppelin yeah, or something. Yeah. And he just laughed for like five minutes and I was just devastated. God, that's painful. I've had that happen. I do that with Sarah goes downstairs in the office. I still behave like that yeah. by myself. I put AirPods on and I go fucking crazy. Which was, by the way, the com goddamn comedy jams allowed me to live out some of this, which has been fun. Yeah. But I still jump around like a fucking nut. And uh, I always like, she'll leave the, our apartment door unlocked and I'll lock it. So she probably thinks I'm in there like sniffing <laughs> her panties and jerking off or whatever. You said you're rocking but out. I'm really yeah. just lip syncing. But Well, I had, I had a friend named Gene who was like a rock star. He was like a guy. He Simmons? was like, no, he was, uh, Gene Rapol was his name, but uh, he was, he was, his locker was next to mine in high school and yeah. he was like 13 years old and he's already like, you know, he's already been like toured Europe as a rock star. Wow. Like he was like smoking packs of cigarettes while we're in like fourth grade or something. Uh, I'm exaggerating. But anyway, he was a really cool guy. I looked up to him and, uh, and I remember telling him the story. I go, yeah, my friend Danny saw me trying to rock out to Led Zeppelin. and I was just mortified. And then I remember Gene just looks at me and he goes, if you don't rock out in front of your mirror, you're fucking nothing, man. <laughs> It's like, all right, cool. I feel better about it. Yeah, it's all you these know. different perspectives. Isn't it weird when you meet kids that just like aren't embarrassed by oh, shit? I know. They're just yeah. like, what? Well, those are the ones that wind up being rock stars or something. Yeah, I know? guess so. But you've been extremely successful in show business. Well, I, I think that when I was in, okay, so when I was 18, I started taking this uh, community college class in like performance for the camera. Like my friend and I did it as a gag, but we still couldn't take it seriously. We're just like, they'd give us copy to say into the camera and we just still would only do it if we knew that our friend was laughing about it. You know? Right. Like, right. Like we would never do it for real. And, uh, I think it's a matter of just being too insecure to look like you're actually trying something. You know? Yeah. It's a weird, uh, it's like a wall. It's a protection. Yeah. And so, uh, so I eventually, uh, went to UCLA, got a degree in political science and I had my hopes set on being either, either going to law school or I was kind of into journalism, but I was going to do something that was going to be a, a quote unquote straight job, you know, where it's just like a regular, it wasn't going to be a gig type thing. Right. But, uh, in like 94, um, I think it was about 93 or 94 could have been 92. <laughs> I don't know who cares, but, uh, I had this one song that my friends from high school used to laugh and they'd make me do it. They'd be like, you got to do that one song where you read all the headlines or whatever. And so I started doing that and I did it at a uh, little place called the Upfront Comedy Club in Santa Monica on a Friday night. And there were only like 12 people in the audience and uh, just, just totally destroyed. Wow. And, uh, I was like, yeah, that felt pretty good. And and I was I was being quiet and doing my own thing. And, and I had the guitar here, so I felt like I, I was sort of like a security blanket. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't like I was out there, you know, putting myself out there too much. And then I started going to open mic nights. I went to a place called the Cinegrill, did it. And then there's like 30 people in the room and that killed with them. And then I was like, okay, I think I'm going to do this. And then ever since then, it's been all entertainment. It's interesting. So you were at home just writing songs on your own, just for like your buddies. Uh, well, I, I was, I was a musician in high school. Like I had, I had a band, you know, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Did you sing and, in that uh, band? Uh, no, I was, I was too shy. I was too embarrassed. Um, I remember trying to sing at home 
to some uh, cassette tapes that we made of the instrumentals. And but now I would never. Now it's it's such a weird thing. Like it's just it's incredibly uh, embarrassing to put yourself out there and wear your heart out on your sleeve and be a singer. You know, it's just like uh, I don't know how people do it. I talk about this all the time. It must be. I was just joking about it on on Tuesdays with stories of like it's got to be so hard to uh, actually it wasn't on Tuesdays with stories. It was on some other thing, but it doesn't matter. It must be so hard to be like, what do you guys think of this? I love you and I'll die with it. Like to just <laughs> yeah. really bear your soul. And I'm like so grateful people do because I'm such a huge fan of of rock and roll and singer songwriter and, you know, Jackson Brown and all these guys. And I'm like the Avett brothers. I'm like, thank God these people do this. But I'm like, I would feel like such a fucking no, I know. douche being like, yeah, here's that's, this song that's what I'm about my feelings. About. Well, yeah, when I was in high school. Uh, we would never do that with one of our friends. It was, it was already way too many stakes socially. Anyway, you weren't going to try something that was risky in any way. Yeah. And I remember one, probably my best friend during that time. Uh, he's like, Hey man, I got, I got a song. I don't know. I like play it for you. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, he, he's got a song. Like we've <laughs> never talked about writing songs or anything like that, but he's actually going to sit there and play acoustic guitar and he's going to sing a song to me while we're just sitting here in a room. This is weird. And it was extremely uncomfortable. He's just like, here, let me know what you think. And he's like, um, I love you or whatever. And I just go like, I just <laughs> like that. And it, he's like, ah, yeah, no, 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 it's stupid. And it's like, I probably ruined his entire. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I think this I, like is I'm, like, <laughs> and I, and I had to explain to him, I go, no, I'm not laughing at your song. I was laughing at the uncomfortable moment and please continue. And he's like, I'm not going to continue. <laughs> it's, it's like he did one line and it just started cracking up. Well, that's my favorite dialogue ever in Seinfeld. When uh, Elaine asked Jerry to go watch Mel Torme and he goes, I don't know. I can't watch a man sing a song. <laughs> she goes, what are you crazy? And he goes, they get emotional. They sway. It's embarrassing. And I'm like, it makes me laugh so hard. It is because there's a moment where like, I'll go to see whatever artist, And I'm like, this is incredible, but it's teetering on that thing. Like I can put my mind in a place of like, what a fucking dork. <laughs> yeah. What is this? No, I mean, it's, uh, well, and also I think that the mindset that you have is the mindset of a lot of comics, especially the ones that use their real voice when they're standing there doing comedy. Right. Um, like myself, like you. And, uh, but I, I don't, I think that we would be embarrassed if we were trying to do anything character or like, you know, um, uh, and I, I think it's it's a shyness, but it's like if if we're sort of still ourselves, then there's nothing different. We're not really putting it out there too much, you know. Yeah, but it's interesting because in some ways we're putting ourselves out there more because you're like, this is who I am. Yeah. Present- so if people don't like you, they're like, I don't like you. Yeah. I don't like who you are. But it is. Um, That's okay though to me. <laughs> I don't yeah. mind if they don't like me. I just don't want to look like I tried something and failed. I mean, I don't know. It's it's weird. Well, I remember on. Uh, on the Mark Marin show, are you allowed to say other podcasts while you're on a we'll podcast? We'll cut it. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, WTF, it's called. Brian Regan uh, was on there, and Marin was like, so have you ever bombed? And it's kind of hard to picture Brian Regan bombing. Yeah. You just kind of figure he's bomb-proof. And he's just like, oh, yeah, and and I'm a big act, so when it falls, it, it falls hard. Right. And and I was just like, wow, I never even thought about that. I mean, he's one of the best that there's ever been. Yes. And uh but but yeah, when you're when you're really big, you're you're raising the stakes even more so there's further to fall, I guess. You know? That's why I when I first started, I was like really into Jim Carrey. I loved Jim Carrey. That yeah. was like, you know, late nineties at that point. Like I was like 12 through 15 at the height of Jim Carrey. So I was like obsessed with the guy. And also I'm a goofy guy. I like to jump around and get silly and, you know, do fucking somersaults on the couch. And I thought of like bringing that into my standup, but it's like, if you bomb while doing a handstand or whatever, you just look like a complete (laughs) lunatic. So that's why like, I ended up just standing there being like, here's a funny thing that happened. Is this funny? Yeah. And um, yeah, it was definitely... I didn't want to be that guy jumping around. Dane Cook is another one who's kind of like that. Like yeah. the way he talks, like if it's not going well, yeah. it just looks like a complete idiot. Yeah, well, it looks like yeah, you're just completely out of your mind. And and that's why I got to say I got to I respect those people that can commit that hard because uh a lot of us myself included are just like, "Hey, 
if this fails, I didn't really do anything anyway. So uh, I'm just a guy talking at least. There's not, it's not like I was trying something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I feel like I've done that a lot in my career in general. It's like, if I never really try hard, I can be like, well, I failed because I didn't really, I didn't yeah. really try. Yeah, if you put it out there, that's also another thing. This is a little trick for you. Um, never charge any money for your work <laughs> because that way if they say you suck, just be like, well, you get what you pay for. Yeah, it's free. And uh, that's my little trick. The problem is you don't get to make any money. Though, nah, so yeah, that's, tough... I got to work that part out. Now, what about, did you deal with, because uh, I, when I first heard of you, I think it was from like Jason Cantor, our buddy, past mm -hmm. guest. And he said, uh, my friend Henry Phillips is coming to town. He made a movie. I first saw you on the screen, which by the way, again, I've, I've that's right at the quad times. cinemas. Yeah. Right? That was an amazing little, little moment in my life. That was a great time. Yeah, and you did uh, Q and A, which is before I even met you. I just watched you do Q and A. Two thousand eight, but that movie was so or touching. Two thousand nine, uh, Punching the Clown, which we've talked about before, a great film, and uh, it's such a, a couple questions about it. It's such a beautiful movie and hilarious, and um, that's how I kind of knew. Oh, I guess two questions. I'll come back to the movie, but he was like, "This is my friend Henry." Before he, he didn't introduce me this way, but he said. Henry's the guitar act that everybody loves. He's like the one guitar act that everyone's like, this guy's great. Did you feel self-conscious in stand-up comedy? Because still sometimes people I go, oh, yeah, my yeah. friend, he plays guitar. And they're like, oh, I would never have a guitar guy here. And oh, you have to be worst. like, oh, it's a totally different thing. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, <laughs> it, it was, I remember going to San Francisco Punchline, which already you're coming from LA going to San Francisco. That's not... We have a San Francisco uh, gentleman here who could probably attest to this. It's, it's not like they walk around going, oh, I love L.A. people so much. <laughs> <laughs> right. But even worse, if they do comedy without a guitar and you show up with a guitar. I mean, I was basically just in the corner. Uh, this is not my line, but Stan Hope said it was it was similar to uh, showing up to uh, an orgy and everybody knows you're the guy who has herpes, you know? And so I was like, <laughs> it's always gotta be herpes. But, uh, so I just remember being in the corner and, uh, and just sitting by myself and just having this big, stupid guitar and going, man, all these people, I remember Margaret Cho was in the room and there were a lot of other great San Francisco comics and they were all amazing. And I went up and did my act and it went fine, but I just felt, yeah, I felt the, the hatred, um, about everything that I, I was doing. And I think it's because there was a feeling of, um, well, if you need the guitar, that's sort of like a crutch. Right. And I had people say that to me and I would be like, well, but what if that's, that's what I do? Like, it's not like, would you say like Eddie Van Halen? Yeah. If you didn't have that guitar right, though, right. it's like, well, that's what I do. <laughs> you know, right. Like, right. Yeah. Jimmy <laughs> Hendrix had a real crutch. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're using that guitar. Let's see you try to do the same thing with no guitar. Um, but, but then there started to become a whole new generation and what you had, well, Adam Sandler had his Hanukkah song and then Tenacious D came out and flight of the Concords, right, right. and all of a sudden everybody's like, oh yeah, you could be hilarious with music. Um, but yeah, I think, I think what Canner was talking about was that I, I didn't do, I didn't go for low hanging fruit in my right. comedy. I was always trying to, I, I was, I was, I was trying to, um, do it so that if you took the music out, the bit would still be of a course, funny yeah. bit. And, um, but yeah, a lot of comics that use the guitar were just sort of using it like, you know, uh, I'll just take a song, you know, wasting away in Diarrheaville or whatever, and <laughs> right, then just right. sing it. And everybody <laughs> is like, all right, well, I love the song anyway. So right, he's just right. doing Jimmy Buffett. So you really can't give credit to that person. And then they just put diarrhea into it. And so that's automatically funny, you right. know? And, uh, that's that's what pissed a lot of comics off because it's really really hard to compete with that. Of course, Those yeah, guys it's hard to kill. follow. They kill. There was a comic named Dave Andrew, Dave Andrews in Boston. He had a joke where he said, "All my life I've been kissing your left tit because the right one's missing." Oh no! <laughs> See, um, now that was funny to me. But one time, he it's was, funny. Well, we, we can talk more about that, but the, we do that a lot in punching the clown. But it's yeah, this funny is, is it ironically funny or is it funny? As it is. You know? No, they have this conversation in that Talking Funny on HBO. Remember that old special yeah, they had with yeah. Gervais and all them? And they're like, they do sitting on a cock because I'm gay. Classic. And they're like, I'm like, and I'm with, I think Louis said it, I'm with, I'm like, no, that is funny. Yeah. That's very funny. Yeah. It's not fair to say that it's not funny. You know, like, you, 
if you laughed at it, then it was funny. You know, I yeah. laughed when you did that one. Um, um, there, this is just a real funny, quick moment. I put out like an APB to all my friends, to my comic friends. And I was like, I know you guys have a bad, uh, you know, parody song, but we've got a character in the movie called stupid Joe who does all these parody songs. So please give them to me. And, uh, Rick Overton is a genius. And he gave us the catchphrase, let's get guitarded, which was amazing. <laughs> And uh, and Mark Cohen brought a lot of great ones to the table. Totally ripped a big um, fart is my favorite. Well, one. okay, so that one was Arge Barker. Oh, that's a great one. Arge Barker uh, called me and he goes, "Hey man, um, just uh, just pitching this one to you. Uh, once upon a time, I was holding it in, but now my cheeks are spreading apart." Tried to take a poo, but totally ripped a big far. And he's like, so, you know, that might be something that you work with. And then I was like, that is so fucking genius. Anyway, you looked at it and then we did it. And then Arge told me later that at the time that he was doing that, he was in a limo with Flight of the Concords. They were going to like a big show that he was going to be opening for. And they were just like, what the fuck was that, man? That was the worst. <laughs> you know, it's like, if were you, who were you pitching that to? And, uh, I don't think they knew that we were actually looking for bad right, right, right. comedy, but it was great in the context of it. Um, but yeah, it brings up this question. Are we laughing at the thing or are we laughing at making fun of the thing? I don't know. But uh, yeah, so that was a big part of the movie. Either way, it's great. But the movie is so beautiful. And it's on YouTube now. We were talking yeah. before. They can, you can hit you pause can, if you're watching yeah, this. If, watch we, it now. if we need to plug anything today, the movie is literally on YouTube. You don't even have to watch an ad. Just put Punching the Clown official mo or full movie. And it's all there. But it's such a beautiful movie. And the movie really uh, touched me the first time. I saw it, and many times since I've watched it 50 times. And um, I'm, I'm curious about the ending or if you if you knew it was going to be poignant or thought it was poignant. Because you're somebody that really, truly, I'm always struck by it, truly loves comedy and comedians. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the movie, the woman says, uh, I thought you quit. And you deliver the line so perfectly because it's not a big moment. It's just so earnest. You're like, no, I can't quit. I love it. And it's such a touching scene. And I guess I'm just asking you to talk a little bit about how much you love comedy and comedians and how that came to be. Yeah. And the movie. The well, there, the movie. there's a whole scene and I'm sure those outtakes are somewhere or actually I don't think they are. I think I think all the raw footage from the movie has been destroyed somehow. It was on a hard drive that failed or whatever. <laughs> it was all on a laptop. And uh, we had a whole scene where I do a whole flirty thing with that girl. Yeah. And uh we watched it and we're just cringing both Greg and I, the director and I uh, are just cringing because it's just like, this is just trying to be a romantic comedy and not even being good at it. And it's terrible. So we got rid of it. And so we cut to that line that you were talking about. Um, it, uh, I think it was honest. Like that's, yeah, that's what we wound up opting for. And that is always better. It's like, write what you know, kind of thing. And apparently the idea of me doing this whole flirtatious thing with this girl uh, just just wasn't working. And so we just cut it out and then just end with me saying, no, I love comedy. And then that's the end of it. But it's honest. Well, um, that's the real relationship to me in the movie is you with the road and yeah. performing. I mean, that's the real love story in the movie to me. Yeah. I, yeah. I love comedy so much. Um, some of the best times ever that I've ever spent have been just sitting around with a bunch of comics and just, uh, just telling funny stories or just laughing at funny concepts or whatever. I mean, had some of the best times of my life, you know, yeah. just laughing super hard. And so with the movie, we were able to take a lot of those things and actually put them on a screen. All, all a film is, is really just, you want to tell a story, but you want to tell it even better than just saying it. Out right, loud. Of course. So trying to act out the whole thing. And, um, we got to tell a lot of them in that, but, uh, yeah. That's a, a beautiful thing about when we shot our movie, 4th of July, also available, not for free on YouTube. Fantastic for, movie. Thank you. I loved it. For $15 on louisck.com. But, um, we hung out. I think I told you this before. We hung out every night. It was Tony V, great comic, and Nick DiPaolo and me. Oh, and man, Louis you guys must have been. And Chris Walsh. And we just sat around like campfire just telling stories. And Tony V said it so well, and it reminded me of your movie. He's like, what an incredible gift that we can sit here 10 nights in a row and tell stories for hours without yeah. repeating one just because of the amount of 
truly insane people we've met in yeah. this business. And it's you're, you're, you have an amazing ability to retain all these stories, which is so fascinating to me. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've been told that. I don't know. I mean, I've had this, but you do too. I mean, I don't know if uh, there's just some people that remember them more because I I've had times when I'm with somebody else and a thing will happen. And then 10 years later I retell it and they don't remember it happening or, or they didn't see that it was, they didn't think it was funny or whatever, but I thought it was classic or whatever. So that, that happens sometimes where you just make a mental note of it. Right. But I don't know. Um, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. We're like, if at, at one point uh, you look back and go, ah, you know, could have done things differently or whatever, but uh, no, I have gotten the opportunity to ha to hang out with literally, like I don't know if it's subjective or not subjective, but some of what society has called the funniest people right, in right. the world, you know, and um, that's fantastic, and and be able to hang out and laugh and uh, stuff like that, it's just uh, yeah, that's what I value. A lot of people, other people value things like uh, stability or success or whatever. But, <laughs> or money. <laughs> yeah. Things that have actual yeah. value. And, uh... Yeah. But no, nah, man, I remember some really good times like uh, after a show and then we'd all go to a bar and then we'd just be laughing so hard at this, you know, type of stuff. <laughs> and yeah, we got to get them all out there, put them in movies, I'm working on a third movie now. And we just did a reading for it a few days ago. Now, does yeah, does well, well. does the new movie have the because my favorite story of yours of all time? Maybe you can tell it <laughs> is the um, the the apartment where you're supposed to be quiet and you went outside to have a cigarette. Oh, wow! That should be in the script. To me, that is oh, the best. I'm, I'm story. glad that you reminded me of that one. I completely forgot about. Oh, that. plug that in because no, that's yeah. like my number one favorite story wow. of yours. If you all want right. to tell it, I, I just completely forgot about it. Yeah, we've made three movies and I must have. Yeah, that was in some iteration of our punching the uh, punching Henry, but then it didn't, didn't, we didn't wind up doing it, but it's funny uh, cause I just said you remember stories better than yeah, like, yeah. your best story. Yeah. Ever. But, but, uh, yeah, there's, uh, maybe that new ones happen and it pushes the other one out. I don't know how that works, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was in Hollywood. We all finished up at a bar or whatever. And of course we want to still hang out and, uh, drink more. And so, uh, there were these two guys that lived in an apartment there in Hollywood and they were like, well, we can go to my place, but I got to say the landlord lives upstairs. He's a crotchety old guy and he's an asshole. You just got to be quiet. Just don't be a dick. Just please don't be a dick. We can go in there. We can all, you know, have drinks. You know, there were girls hanging out and everything like that, but let's just please be quiet. Cause we want to, we still have to live in this place. And this guy's just ready to evict us. And I was like, all right. So we all go in there and we're all being very quiet and we're drinking beer and everything's going great. At some point, I go out to have a cigarette by myself, and so I'm smoking a cigarette, and I'm just kind of looking out at the stars and everything like that. And it's a beautiful night. Everything's pretty quiet. And I'm leaning back against the wall, and I hear this really faint buzzing sound, like a... <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is that? It's like... And then I hear this guy coming down from downstairs and I, I turn around and I notice that my back is literally up against a doorbell or a door buzzer. <laughs> and I've just been just sitting here, just leaning on a thing that's going bang. And this guy comes down and it's like, I don't, I remember it like he was wearing one of those old timey, like nighty <laughs> hats, you know, like with stripes on it with a lantern. It's just, oh, in God's name is going on down here. And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, was that you? Oh, sorry. You know, and of course, uh, the whole party ended. He's like, everybody out. And then uh, my friends who live there are just like, what the fuck? We were being so quiet. And I don't know if they even ever knew that I was just leaning against the No, door that's buzzer. the best. I yeah, feel like yeah. I feel like they can't find out in the uh in the movie, at least not right away. Where you're just like, I don't know, that guy's nuts. Oh man. man. Uh that's amazing. I mean, to me it's like such a perfect story, the idea of trying to be quiet and making literally the worst <laughs> noise. Yeah, no, you couldn't have made a I couldn't have made a louder sound in the guy's house for a longer period of time. It was exactly what we were trying to avoid. Which reminds me of the one when it was, uh, I always think of when you hear that, when I hear that story about at my old apartment, it was you, me and Nikki Glazer and Sarah. And I think maybe a uh, canter or something. We were sitting on my front porch. I had a little front porch and I lived in the second floor and the landlord lived in the first floor. And that's where the little porch stoop was. 
and we were hanging out drinking talking telling stories and we somehow we got into a bit about what if we we when we came it came out like boiling hot if you just come like 200 degree come and it would burn you and we we're like oh fuck and then you'd burn the girl and that was the topic of conversation we were all laughing and getting loud and then the guy came out and they were asian or whatever um asian mm-hmm. and uh, i think chinese and he was but he was like I, I, I think you can't do the accent anymore, but he was yelling, going, ah, yeah. And we all went upstairs and we were like, what the fuck was that shit? What a maniac. And then we slowly realized, I'm like, well, we were yelling about hot cum <laughs> outside. His, we were yeah. sitting outside his bedroom. It's like 1.50 in the morning. There's five people being like, hot cum. Yeah, you're coming and it's super hot. Yeah. Oh, and that's... then we were like, what's up with this guy? Yeah, I know. And I'm sure there was drinking probably back in those, at that time. Oh, yeah. I was. And uh, yeah, you just have no idea how loud your voice is. And uh well, I remember, okay, so here, this is a little bit of a two-parter. So there's Christine Levine. Do you know who she is? Yeah. She's an amazingly funny comic. She's part of the whole Doug Stanhope yeah, yeah, crew. And she her, opened yeah. for him. So I remember one time going to the comedy store and seeing her tell a story that was unbelievably funny. And um, it was, uh, I, I'm not going to try to do justice to the story, but basically she's working at a porn shop and a guy comes in with a giant sausage that he was holding like a baby. And he looks at her and he's like, she's like, I don't know what's happening there. And he went into one of the jack off booths and then he left without the sausage. And she's like, what the fuck? And then goes in there and there's like this sausage with a hole drilled in it and like come all in there and she's just like what the hell and by the way it's been about 15 years so i might even be messing up the story maybe it wasn't even about the no but i i just remember the next day being really excited trying to repeat that story to a bunch of friends and we're just like at a diner and uh i was just like so apparently like she's like what happened and and they find the sausage and it's got cum. Like the guy just fucked a sausage and just came all in it and just fucking like left it in this porno boot. And then I just like turn around. There's just a whole family with kids and everything. <laughs> and I'm just like that. And I see like the dad looking at like that. And I'm like, oh, that's right. We're in public. You can't get excited and talk about stuff like that. But no. uh, yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's always with comics, it's way more vile than what the average person would just be saying. Yeah, I tell that story all the time, too. I'm like, recently I was using my Starbucks app and it wouldn't go through. And I was like, oh, sorry, my app just keeps being cunty. <laughs> and the lady was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry. I, was, I hang out with fucking animals. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. not a big deal. I just use the fucking like second worst word. <laughs> oh. like a lady at Starbucks. No, yeah, those are, the, yeah, I have comics. Yeah, we have a whole different idea of what's normal to say in a conversation yeah i think i feel like it gets yeah yeah it's got me in trouble for sure where i'm just like oh sorry yeah that's funny to me or like death some kind of like death you know plane crash kids dying stuff like that and people like oh my god and you're like oh i don't it doesn't matter uh i feel like we got to wrap up this is just i can sit here and do this all day no it's great right we have to we have to put a bow on it i'm already feeling insecure about everything i've said this yeah we'll cut it'll be 12 minutes long we'll cut everything all right good no it's been great and um what else do you want to plug you got the albums and the Uh, movie and all the things well twice a week i went every wednesday at 11 a.m every sunday at noon uh this is pacific time I'm on Twitch and I do a live cooking lesson. We do Q and A and uh, people request songs. So I do guitar, uh, we play games and it's a fun time. It's a little bit like a podcast, but it's a cooking show. And the handle on Twitch is henlips1. And I'm having a lot of fun on that. And then also uh, the YouTube channel, henlips. And you can see Punch in the Clown and then start getting into the other videos on that channel. And the Twitch does really well, right? You have a ton of people. Yeah. No, I've got, yeah, I've got like, I shot up to 42,000 people like immediately. And then for eight months, it's been at that number exactly. So it's almost like anybody who was ever going to be a fan of this (laughs) just very rigidly is like on board and nobody else beyond that. That's wild. It's really weird. And the movie Punching the Clown, of course. And then there's Punching Henry as well. Where do they find that? that? That's on Tubi. What's, I, I don't know, know if anybody knows about Tubi. I don't know anything. I don't it's know Tubi like, or uh, Twitch. It's, uh, if you have Apple TV or Roku or one of those things, it's just one of those channels that uh, a lot of old people watch. Um, and I'm not 
saying that to insult the movie or anything, but for whatever reason, that's where it landed. So maybe it's more of an old person's type movie. I don't know, but uh, no, it's a great you're film. in it. Yeah, I am and, in it. Uh, and, great uh, in it. And uh, J.K. Simmons and all kinds of Sarah Silverman and uh, Jim Jeffries, all kinds of names. Doug Stanhope. Stanhope's in yeah. it. Yeah. You could go on. Nikki Glaser, uh, Brendan Walsh. Uh, who else is in that thing? There's a lot. Uh, Probably leaving people out. Um, uh, somebody else. Oh, Tig. Tig Nataro. Tig Nataro, yeah. Uh, um, so anyway, yeah, an Oscar winner. Henry. Yeah, it's I'm a, in a film with an Oscar on, winner, folks. It's on Tubi. Yeah, but he won the Oscar after he agreed to do the movie, but before the movie came out. So I always felt for him a little bit because he probably like when they called his name <laughs> at the Oscars, and then the Oscar goes to J.K. Simmons. The first thing he probably thought was. Why did I fucking do that stupid I, movie? I, I gotta get out of Just held out like six months <laughs> right. or something. But it's great. And uh, I mean, that alone is such an amazing accomplishment to make two feature films that are fantastic and possibly Thanks, a third man. coming. Well, you've got half of that right now. You have one. Yeah, that's great. True. I saw it in the theater. Absolutely loved it. Thank you. And all three have lost a great deal of money. So <laughs> Yeah, no, there's no money in any of this stuff. <laughs> so make sure you make a film. But it's exciting and it's great. And uh, it's always great to see you. And I'm yeah. glad you're here. We'll do it again. Absolutely. Next time. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Henry Good Phillips, times. everybody. I'm Joe List and... I don't have an outro thing that I say, so that's it.